Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Michael King, and I'm the Executive Director of the Southwest Seattle Historical Society. I'm thrilled to welcome you to this month's uh, iteration of Words, Writers, and Southwest Stories. Uh, before we begin tonight, though, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that the Southwest Seattle Historical Society and our beloved Log House Museum are located on the traditional land of the Duwamish people, past and present, and we are grateful to the Duwamish people for stewarding the land throughout the generations. This evening's session is made possible by our partnerships with the Seattle Public Library, as well as by the generous support of our sponsors For Culture, Luna Park Cafe, and Duwamish Tribal Services. We are grateful for the support of all of our partners and sponsors who make these presentations possible. We're also grateful for your support. We cannot host free programs like the one we're about to enjoy this evening without the help of generous donors like you. So I encourage you to donate or to purchase a membership to support our programming. Uh, your generosity, again, it makes these experiences possible for our entire community and we're grateful. We're gonna post a link uh, in our donate, uh, in the chat momentarily. It looks like uh, that's already taken place. So if you're interested in donating or purchasing a membership, please uh, click that link. I also want to make sure you're aware of our next upcoming digital program, which is scheduled for 5.30 p.m. on Friday, February 26th. We are hosting a panel conversation called Here for the Beer, which will explore the history of brewing in our city and how craft brewing has shaped our collective identity, of course, with a focus on the Duwamish Peninsula. The panel is going to feature brewers from local favorites, Elliott Bay Brewing, Future Primitive Brewing, and the Good Society. So be sure to register today. Uh, there's a suggested donation of $10 to help support the development of additional historical society programs. Again, it looks like there's a, a registration link uh, posted in the chats, uh, or there will be momentarily. So um, uh, we're looking forward to your participation on February 26th. Given the size of our audience this evening, we're gonna utilize the Q&A function for our question and answer session. If you have a question for our presenter, please type it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Our moderator this evening is gonna field your questions and we'll direct them to our speaker after he concludes his presentation. With all of that said, again, thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure to turn things over to Dora Faye Hendricks, who's the chair of the Words Writers and Southwest Stories series, as well as a member of the Historical Society's Board of Trustees. Dora Faye, it's all yours. Thank you, Michael. Our guest tonight is Brad Holden, a local author, historian, and finder of old things. When not out searching for local historical artifacts, he says he enjoys about he enjoys writing about Seattle's past. Tonight, Brad presents his book, Seattle Prohibition, Bootleggers, Rum Runners, and Graft in the Queen City, published through Arcadia Publishing and Goodreads. Inspired by adventures as an urban archaeologist in which he went to estate sales, flea markets, and swap meets in search of items with local historical significance, Brad found the remnants of an old copper moonshine still, which prompted him to start researching prohibition history here in the Seattle area, and which eventually led to the writing of his book. We're going to hear from Brad that prohibition consumed Seattle, igniting a war that lasted nearly 20 years and played out in the streets, waterways, and even town hall. Brad will tell us about a former Seattle police officer who became the king of the Seattle bootleggers, a man who ran liquor down from Canada, revolutionizing the speedboat industry, a South Seattle restaurateur who started the state's biggest moonshining operation and scurrying around the law, the Coast Guard and a director of the Seattle Prohibition Bureau helped with the challenge. Brad is a contributing writer for the online Washington State history site, historylink.org, and has written cover stories for Pacific Northwest Magazine. He also runs a successful Instagram in which he writes about historical artifacts he collects from Seattle for fun. And, C and Brad is the author of a biography about a mysterious Seattle inventor and psychedelic pioneer, Al Hubbard, which is due to be published later this year. So mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen of Seattle, thank you for joining us as we learn some Seattle history from Brad Pullman. Go for it, Brad. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much to the uh, 
Southwest Seattle Historical Society for hosting me. Um, yeah, my name is Brad Holden. I'm a local historian and author of Seattle Prohibition, uh, as well as an upcoming book I just finished writing. It's a biography on uh, one of the more fascinating figures to emerge from Seattle history, a guy by the name of Al Hubbard. And that's due to be published uh, hopefully in August of this year. Um, so as far as the presentation tonight goes, uh, it's been about a year since I've given a presentation. I was given them all the way up to last March. Uh, when COVID hit and of course everything shut down. And since that time, I've just been kind of in my house in solitude writing my book. So hopefully I'm not too rusty. I got some uh, some notes here with me to help uh, perhaps jog my memory if I need it. But I think everything should go pretty smooth. Uh, specifically what I'm gonna uh, talk about my presentation tonight are the events leading up to when uh, Washington went dry uh, back in 1916. So what a lot of you guys probably know uh, is that national prohibition started in 1920, uh, but Washington state voted to go dry almost five years before the rest of the country. And that's because the level of vice had just gotten so prolific throughout the local area that things really got out of hand. And uh, local residents actually voted via state initiative uh, for Washington to go dry, and that started in 1916. So that's what I'm going to talk about tonight, is kind of the events leading up to that, because that to me is um, just as kind of crazy and interesting as what happened after Prohibition took effect, and hopefully you guys find the same thing. So without any further ado, I'll jump right in, uh, and I'll start out by saying that um, there's a lot of misconceptions about prohibition. And one of them is I think a lot of people think that prohibition was a direct retaliation against alcohol itself. Um, that's partly true, but more specifically, prohibition was uh, an indictment against the places where alcohol was being served, saloons. Saloons uh, were kind of the social boogeyman of their time and they were very problematic and that's ultimately what led to prohibition. And that's kind of what I'm gonna cover. Uh, the start of all this started uh, after the Civil War. So after the Civil War in the mid 1800s, um, there was a large influx of German immigrants that moved here uh, to this country from places like Germany and Austria. A lot of them settled in the Midwest, but in other places too, including Texas and, and even here in Western Washington. Um, and like other immigrant groups, they brought their traditions, including their food and beverage traditions with them. And with this particular group, beer was a big popular part of their culture. So as soon as they started getting their communities set up and things kind of set into place, one of the first orders of business for these German uh, communities were uh, setting up breweries to produce beer because that was such a big part of their culture. So that's what they did. And that's, um, that's, in large where America first developed its first love affair with beer. There were breweries and there was beer before then, but it wasn't really a thing until these, these early German immigrant groups kind of uh, got set up and started forming these early breweries. And there are names that we still know today, Anheuser, Bush, Pabst. Um, here in Seattle, a German immigrant by the name of Andrew Himrich set up one of Seattle's first breweries that eventually went on to produce um, the most iconic beer in these parts, of course, Rainier. Uh, and over in Olympia, same thing. The Olympia Brewery was set up by a German immigrant. So it was happening over here in Western Washington too. Um, now, one of the things they, they wanted to do uh, after they kind of set up their breweries, oh, and Michael, can you go to the next slide? I'm, that's in the, uh, there we go. So this is a picture or an illustration of the early Anheuser brewery that was set up over in the Midwest in St. Louis. Um, so this is like one of the first ones that was really set up. So one of the first things they wanted to do is uh, set up a place where people could go and enjoy their beverages, you know, kind of from a business standpoint, it, it was a smart thing to do. So kind of they modeled these early kind of drinking and eating establishments uh, in connection with these breweries, uh, kind of modeled after the beer halls and pubs of their native homeland. And uh, local residents kind of started calling these places saloons, because that was a, a word that was already in place for a, a drinking establishment. So these early brewery places that were setting up these, these drinking establishments, if you will, 
they started just referring to them as saloons. And these early saloons were um, a lot different than what they would eventually become or what you see in the movies. They were very kind of mellow, civil, respectable places. Um, men didn't go there to, to drink and get drunk. Part of that was because these early breweries were producing lager, it's a low alcohol beer. And that's what was largely served at these early brewery saloons is the lager. Um, but there were a lot of just unwritten rules in place about what was expected if you visit these places, how you conduct yourself. You know, you weren't going there to get drunk and start fights and things like that. Uh, a lot of these places um, even offered banking services. You could cash your paycheck there. Uh, voting was allowed. A lot of times you could go and cast your vote there in local elections. They'd have public speakers come in. Um, a lot of kind of the impression I got when I was researching these these places when I was writing my book is that they seem to be very similar to um, kind of coffee houses. You know, if you go to a coffee house and you go in, you see people just sitting at tables and it's kind of quiet and people are just engaged in conversation. That's how these early saloons were. That's kind of the atmosphere of these early places. Um, a, a lot of them were located exclusively in urban areas. And there were a couple reasons for this. For one, uh, beer wasn't being past hadn't started being pasteurized yet, so it had a short shelf life. Um, also, transportation, of course, cars hadn't been invented yet, and railroads hadn't quite taken hold yet. So, a lot of these uh, breweries, you know, they the only way they could transport beer was by a horse and wagon, and of course, so that limited their range about how far they could transport their beer. So, a lot of these early saloons were. Uh, located exclusively in cities and urban areas. Here in Western Washington, you would find the majority of saloons in places like Olympia, Tacoma, Seattle, Everett, up to Bellingham, places like that. Uh, can you go to the next slide? There we go. So that's, uh, that's the early, uh, what would become the Rainier Brewery. At the time it was called the Bayview Brewery because it overlooked Elliott Bay. But that's like one of the first breweries to open in Seattle. Uh, the next slide. So here's some, some pictures of some local Seattle saloons from my uh, photo collection. A lot of these photos that you'll see tonight are photos that I've actually have, have gone out and found at places like estate sales and flea markets and stuff. I'm a local, I'm a collector, especially when it comes to local prohibition. So a lot of these are from my personal collection that I used in the book, including this one right here. Uh, next slide. And here's the Tacoma Saloon, another uh, uh, from my personal collection. And uh, one more. And that's in Olympia. And I think that's the early 1900s. And I, I love that photo. It's one of my favorites. Uh, and then one more. Okay, and this is the this is a Rainier uh, horse-drawn wagon. So this is how the early Rainier brewery was transporting their beer on these horse-drawn carts. So another great photo. So yeah, so a lot of these these early saloons were located in urban areas because of these reasons. Now a lot of this um, things started changing um, around the time the time that Washington attained statehood in 1889. Um, and the catalyst for this was railroads. So railroads started becoming a thing um, and they started becoming very popular and they started just building railroads everywhere. It was a very popular mode of transportation that, that really took hold. And so you had railroads going all over the place. And around the same time, beer started being pasteurized. So now you had uh, an opportunity to transport perishable things in much greater dif in distances than you were previously able to do. And of course, these local breweries took notice of this. So they kind of started following the railroad tracks and started setting up uh, saloons in all these small towns that previously didn't have them before. Now, um, you know, a lot of these urban saloons that I was talking about before were very civil places. Well, these small town saloons that started popping up, they didn't get the memo about how to kind of conduct you know, yourself at these places. Uh, the urban saloons, they had the advantage where, you know, they had time to allow kind of these unwritten rules to take place. Whereas these small town saloons, basically they, they would just appear overnight. 
suddenly in these small towns, there was suddenly uh, a drinking establishment where you could go and you could go in and drink as much as you want anytime you wanted. And it, so things got really crazy with these small town saloons uh, and started, they, they started becoming very problematic and a lot of social problems started happening. Uh, there was a lot of stories about men going and spending all their time and money and income at these saloons and kind of deserting their families. And of course, when you have large congregation of people uh, drinking in excess, you have a lot of social problems that go with that. And that certainly happened with these, these small town saloons. And uh, so the number, the rates of arrest started skyrocketing. Uh, the rates of alcoholism started going up. The rates of divorce started going through the roof. So all these, these social problems started happening as soon as these saloons started opening in all these small towns. And this was happening not just here in Western Washington, but nationwide with, with the advent of the railroads. And it became a real big social problem. And so this was the beginning of what was known as the temperance movement. It was a retaliation against these saloons that uh, these small town folks were seeing, uh, kind of viewed them as like these, these places were invading their small towns and disrupting their way of life. And in a lot of ways they were. So these temperance groups started forming as kind of like a um, grassroots social uh, retaliation against these saloons that were opening. And you had, you saw the, the beginning of groups like the Women's Christian Temperance Movement, or Union, excuse me, the Anti-Saloon League. Uh, a lot of churches started becoming involved. Um, and they really started going after these saloons with, uh, you know, with, just this, this zealous focus to sh shut them down because they were really problematic. So um, that was going on. And around the, a few years later, things started uh, shifting here in Seattle too. And things, the, the nature of saloons really started shifting. And the catalyst for this was the Alaskan gold rush. Uh, so in 1894, gold was discovered up in Alaska and it kicked off this, this ferocious gold rush that happened. And Seattle at the time quickly set itself up as the port city for this gold rush. So in other words, if you were from the lower 48 and you wanted to try your hand at prospecting and you know strike it rich up in Alaska, you would travel up to Seattle and then you'd go down to Elliott Bay and catch a ship that would bring you up to Alaska. And when you wanted to return, it would bring you back. And so what happened with this is suddenly you had a huge influx of um, mostly younger men, late teens, 20s, early 30s, that started flooding Seattle by the thousands um, in, in pursuit of this gold rush. Uh, and, you know, they were looking for a good time, of course, while they were waiting for their ship. And, you know, there's that saying that says if... Uh, if there's a demand for something, a market's going to emerge to satisfy that demand. And that's what happened in Seattle. Uh, Seattle had already been a hotbed of vice before the gold rush. There was always a large amount of saloons and brothels and gambling parlors and things of, of, like that. But once the gold rush hit and all these, these thousands of young men started flooding the town, um, the, the number of vice just proliferated. So you had saloons and billiard parlors and gam and brothels pretty much on every block, on every street corner. And that started becoming really problematic. Um, now the large majority of this activity was located in, in what is now Pioneer Square, Georgetown, South Downtown, that area. There wasn't a lot in West Seattle, but West Seattle did have its share too. So I know since I'm speaking to a lot of audience members from West Seattle, I wanted to include this. I'm going to read an excerpt from my book that talks a little bit about, a little bit about uh, West Seattle's contribution to all this vice. And this, believe it or not, happened at the uh, Luna Park Amusement Park. So here's the excerpt from my book. Other nearby attractions had also caught the attention of local temperance groups, including Luna Park, a popular West Seattle amusement park that boasted an assortment of rides, including a hand-carved carousel and the figure eight roller coaster. At night, however, the park's biggest attraction was its bar, 
which billed itself as the longest and best stock bar in Elliott Bay. This drew an assortment of unsavory characters causing the Seattle Post-Intelligencer to send one of its reporters there on a Sunday night. In the shocking article that followed, a lurid scene at the Luna Park bar was described as, quote, girls hardly 14 years old, mere children in appearance, mingled with older, more dissipated patrons and sat in the dark corners drinking beer, smoking cigarettes and singing. Local religious groups were aghast. It certainly didn't help that the amusement park's logo was a picture of a grinning devil with the slogan, meet me at Luna Park. So there you go. So West Seattle had its contribution to all this level of vice that was proliferating uh, during the 1890s as well. Uh, now in Seattle, uh, a, a very unique institution emerged from all this level of vice and they became known as box houses. And basically, um, Box houses were um, a place you could go where any any form of vice that you wanted to seek out would, was available. And basically, the way the box houses kind of operated and the way they looked was um, it was a big open floor plan like you would see at a, at a regular saloon, tables set up where men could gamble and drink, and then they had a stage set up where the female employees would go up and do suggestive dancing for the enjoyment of the, the male patrons. Um, it was an early form of what would become known as burlesque dancing. And off along the sides of the box houses were uh, partitioned cubicles or boxes, uh, usually with a better couch inside uh, where certain other negotiations could be, you know, figured out with these female employees. So you can kind of use your imagination what was happening. So it was very, uh, kind of crazy places, these box houses. And they were a unique Seattle institution. They started out in Seattle, but they soon spread in popularity up and down the West Coast. Uh, I know San Francisco and Portland had their share of them, but again, they started in Seattle. Uh, the king of these box houses, the so-called king, was a, a man by the name of John Considine. Um, he was a teetotaler himself, meaning he didn't drink, but he ran these uh, box houses with a real kind of tenacious business sense. Um, he famously chased Wyatt Earp out of town, uh, famous gunslinger Wyatt Earp during the gold rush days. He wanted to kind of cash in on everything that was happening here in Seattle. So he set up, a, he moved up here to Seattle I believe in 1897 and set up a saloon that had his, his name on it. And he was a celebrity at the time, so his saloon became very popular. John Considine, of course, viewed this as a, as a business threat to his box houses. So he had a little one-on-one -on -one meeting with Wyatt Earp and encouraged him to, to find another place to set up shop. Uh, of course, Wyatt Earp you know, wasn't known as, as a pushover, so he ignored uh, Considine's advice and he remained in operation Considine was um, very well connected politically. So he used his, his business and political connections and basically had Wyatt Earp chased out of town. I think they, they had some false charges brought up against Wyatt Earp and shut down his place and his, his furniture was even confiscated. So he was sent packing by Considine. So it kind of gives you an idea of what kind of character Considine was. Um, now, despite his falling out with the famous gunslinger Wyatt Earp, he actually had symbiotic relationships with other saloon owners, um, including a guy by the name of Billy the Mug. So one of the, his real name was William Belond, but they called him Billy the Mug because one of the most popular saloons at the time was one he owned called Billy's Mug. And he was a real rough and tumble character. He, um, if, if someone was acting up in his, establishment. He would grab him by the scruff of the neck and throw him out in the street. Uh, he had dog fights and rooster fights that people could uh, wager bets on inside the place itself. Uh, it was it was one of the more rowdy places. Uh, John Considine uh, set up a business agreement with them where Considine set up a gambling parlor on the top floor of Billy's Mug Saloon uh, to kind of cash in on the popularity of the saloon itself. So it was funny, I remember um, when I was researching these, all these people for my book, I had this mental picture of what John Considine looked like. And when I finally saw his picture, I was a little surprised because he didn't quite look like what I imagined in my head. So if you go to the next slide, there you go. So there's a picture of John Considine. 
And, you know, as you can see, you, you picture more kind of a more rough and tumble character than, than what this picture is. But he, he was, he was, he was a force to be reckoned with. Now, Billy the Mug, on the other hand, looked exactly like what you would picture him looking like. So if you go to the next picture, and there's Billy, Billy the Mug right there. So there you go. That's a great picture. And, uh. And he, if, as you can see in the picture, he has a couple dogs with him as well as a couple roosters. And, and like I said, you know, he would he would have dog fights and rooster fights in his in the saloon, unfortunately. So um, John Considine, uh, early in his career, when he was first starting out establishing these box houses, was business partners with a man by the name of William Meredith. Um, at some point, they had some kind of falling out. And so they went their separate ways. But it was a very bitter falling out and they remained really kind of bitter rivals until the very end. Um, of course, Considine went along his path and he went on to become the king of the box houses. Uh, William Meredith actually joined the Seattle police force. And by the time Considine had his box house empire up and running in Seattle, William Meredith worked his way up and he became chief of Seattle police. And so you can imagine what happened between the two men at this point. William Meredith used his um, authority to try to shut down a lot of John Considine's box houses. Considine fought back and it turned into almost like a war between the two men. Uh, ultimately, Considine planted some kind of rumor with the Seattle City Council about William Meredith that was apparently believable enough because uh, they fired William Meredith from his position as chief of police. And uh, as soon as this happened, William Meredith was seeing red and flew into a murderous rage, grabbed a bunch of his guns and went looking for Considine and found him and his brother at a downtown drugstore on 2nd Avenue. And he went busting through the door William Meredith did with a shotgun started blasting away. Somehow Considine and his brother escaped injury. Um, there was a teenage Joda, soda jerk at the counter who got some shrapnel in his shoulder, but um, he didn't end up hitting Considine. A big gunfight ensued between the two men because uh, everyone was armed at that point. And Considine ended up shooting William Meredith dead there in the drugstore. Uh, so he was arrested, Considine was arrested and he eventually went, the case went to trial and he was acquitted on grounds of self-defense. You know, he said, Meredith came looking for me. I didn't go looking for him. He opened fire on me. I was just protecting myself. So uh, he was acquitted on grounds of self-defense. And when that happened, Seattle already had a sizable temperance movement already forming because of the, the, the amount of vice that was just taken over the entire city. But this was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. Like, not only did you have all these saloons and box houses everywhere that was disrupting people's way of life, not only did you have the world's, you know, longest, craziest bar over at the Luna Park Amusement Center, but now you have the king of the box houses and having a gunfight with the chief of police and shooting the chief of police dead and getting acquitted from it. So for a lot of the more morally minded citizens of Seattle, this was kind of the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. And this really set off, um, well, what it did is it kind of divided the Seattle into two different fractions. Uh, they were known as the closed town and open town. Uh, the closed town, or excuse me, the open town fraction believed that um, like things like prostitution and drinking and gambling were normal human activities that should be allowed, but how about if we just confine everything to one section of town? So their proposal was uh, putting everything in the Tenderloin District, which is now Pioneer Square. So in other words, all the saloons, all the brothels would just be in this one part of town. So if you wanted to visit those places, you could go there and then the rest of the town would be spared from uh, kind of being taken over by all these places. Now the closed town fraction believed these, these kind of things shouldn't be allowed at all and everything should be shut down completely and forever. Um, and so you, you had two figureheads that emerged uh, on, the, um, on the closed town side, you had a guy by the name of Mark Matthews. He was a reverend. He was a tall, uh, 
tall kind of lanky fellow with a big head of hair. They called him the black mane lion. He had his start. Um, he would set up crates outside of saloons and preach as people were coming in trying to, uh, you know, save their souls and stuff before they went into the saloons, trying to prevent people from going into saloons. So he kind of took over as the figurehead of the closed town fraction. And if you go to the uh, next slide, that's a picture of Mark Matthews. He, um, he set up, uh, it was the Seattle Presbyterian Church, and it became the world's first mega church. Uh, when he opened it, so many citizens were kind of outraged over what was happening in the town that they started joining his church in droves. And so his church became the, the most popular church at the time. And that was downtown again, that was the Seattle Presbyterian Church. Now, if you have any doubts as to um, Mark Matthews' opinion of what saloons were like, uh, go to the next slide. And I present you this quote. The saloon is the most fiendish, corrupt, hell-soaked institution that ever crawled out of the slime pit, out of the slime of the eternal pit. It takes your sweet, innocent daughter, robs her of her virtue, and transforms her into a brazen, wanton harlot. It is the open sore of the land. So there you go. Very strong words from Mark Matthews, uh, who made it very clear where he stood on the issue of saloons. So he was he took over the closed town side. Now, the open town side, kind of the figurehead for that movement became uh, taken over by a guy by the name of Hiram Gill. Hiram Gill was an attorney. He uh, arrived in Seattle during the gold rush days. Um, and he recognized an unfulfilled niche. And he, what he did is he set up a law practice for uh, saloon owners and brothel owners and people like that uh, to help keep them out of jail. And it became a very successful law practice, as you can imagine, because that was such a, a big element of the city at the time. But he had higher ambitions than just keeping saloon owners out of jail. He wanted to get into politics. So he ran for the Seattle City Council and was elected. And he served on and off the Seattle City Council uh, leading into the 1910 elections, at which point he put his, his hat in the ring to, uh, to run as mayor, as mayor of Seattle. So this 1910 Seattle, um, you have Mark Matthews, who's uh, leading a very energized movement against these saloons. And then you had Hiram Gill, who's running as mayor on the open town platform. And, you know, he was telling voters, hey, if I'm elected mayor, I hear your complaints, but we'll just confine all these places into, the, into what's now Pioneer Square and the rest of the town will be spared. And, you know, this I promise you. And apparently his message resonated with enough people because in 1910, Hiram Gill was elected mayor. Um, but he, he proved himself to be as corrupt as you probably suspect he was. Uh, one of the first things he did, one of the first order of business is his, him and his police chief uh, set up a system where they collected $10 a month from all of Seattle's working prostitutes uh, is, is kind of like, keep you out of jail money, protection money. Um, any prostitute that refused to pay was put into jail. He set up a real uh, shady graph system where city contracts were awarded to the highest bidder. So, you know, whoever greased his palms with the most money would, would land whatever kind of uh, city contract they wanted. Uh, this included a team of developers who wanted to build a 500 room uh, building on Beacon Hill in South Seattle. And they greased Hiram Gill's palms and he signed off on, on their business plan. And so they went to, to work on, on building the structure and it opened a few months later. Um, incidentally, one of the um, kind of, one of the developers that was working with them was also the owner of the Luna Park Amusement Park. So another little West Seattle uh, connection there for you. So yeah, a few months later, uh, after they, they were approved to build this place. They opened up and it was, as it turned out, a brothel. It was a 500 room brothel that opened. And at the time, it was the world's largest brothel. Um, so on one hand, you had the world's largest church at the time, the Seattle Presbyterian Church being run by Mark Matthews. Now on the other hand, you had the world's largest brothel. 
both at the same time. So that kind of gives you an idea of what Seattle was like at the time and how divided it was. And these buildings were very symbolic of, of that time period. Um, now, when Hiram Gill was elected as mayor, Mark Matthews knew kind of, he kind of had his number. He knew kind of what kind of character Hiram Gill was. So he um, hired the William, a couple of detectives from the William Burns Detective Agency to kind of like keep tabs on Hiram Gill and see what he was up to. Can you go to the next slide? Okay, a little backstory. So this is, um, we're going back a little bit. This is an actual um, church membership card signed by Mark Matthews from my collection. I forget where I found that particular one, but I thought that was pretty cool. It had a signature on it. And this was the large, you know, the mega church that he set up in Seattle. Uh, can you go to the next slide? So this is a mailer from the Anti-Saloon League, the local Anti-Saloon League that was based out of Seattle. Um, and it was, you know, propaganda that they would mail out to try to get people against the saloon industry. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a march going on. This is a Women's Christian Temperance Union Parade in downtown Seattle. I believe that's on 2nd Avenue, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and I forget what year this took place, but it was right around this time period when all this temperance movement was going on in the, the closed town, open town. Uh, next slide. I, I'm sorry, Brad, I have a question yes. for you. Yes. Um, someone is asking, saying Mark Matthews was an opponent of women's suffrage. This doesn't seem to match his prohibition impulses. Do you have any insight into that contradiction? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it was it was kind of a complicated issue because he later was aligned with the women's suffrage movement, with the Women's Christian Temperance Union. But at the time, um, so so the anti saloon movement, the, the the temperance movement at the time was actually seen as kind of a progressive movement. It seems counterintuitive at this point of time, you know, looking back on it to think of something like a temperance movement as being progressive, but at the time it was. Um, and that's where Mark Matthews was aligned with. He was aligned with what was viewed as a progressive movement. The suffrage movement though, kind of went against his more conservative instincts at the time. You know, of course the women's suffrage movement was allowing the women the right to vote. Um, so it was, it was kind of a weird con conflicted thing that he was involved in because on one hand he was um, aligned with these groups, but on the other hand, he was kind of going directly against one of their principal missions, which was allowing women the right to vote. Uh, in 1910, incidentally, when Hyde Gill was elected mayor, Washington women were also uh, once again reinstated voting rights. And this is gonna play a little, uh, play into the story a little later. So it was just a, an interesting time period. Um, women had a brief period where they were allowed to vote and it was taken away from them by the Washington state legislator. I forget what year, but it was reinstated again in 1910, the same year that Hiram Gill. And this would actually kind of lead to his downfall as we'll get to in a minute. So hopefully that answered your question. It was, it was just kind of a weird time where things were kind of mixed up politically. And um, even though there were certain alliances between them, there was also divisions at the same time. I guess politics is a complicated thing and it was just as complicated then as it is now. So hopefully that answers Great. your question. Very good answer, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, so this is a float from the Women's Christian Temperance Movement, another parade. Um, it's, I know it's hard to see on my screen, I don't know if everyone can see it, but on the, the side of the float itself, says Keith Washington White and of course when you read that initially you're like you know what is this is this some kind of uh, white supremacy but it wasn't uh, white was the um, was the color of purity of specifically of purity from alcohol so keep Washington white just meant keep Washington free from alcohol it didn't have anything to do with any kind of uh, racial connotations um, the, another thing about the women's Christian temperance union it's they were an interesting group to study. Um, I think they've been villainized throughout the, um, the, the ages. You know, they were the ones that kind of ultimately led to prohibition. So, you know, a lot of people view them as they reigned on everyone's parade and took away everyone's fun. 
Um, but like I said, they were viewed as a progressive group. One of the things they did, one of their missions was um, at the time when they became a group, the age of, cons of consent in a lot of places was 12 and 13 years old, which is crazy to think about now. Um, and they raised the age of consent laws um, in a lot of states up to age 16, which is still young by today's standards, but a lot better than 12 years old. So, you know, they weren't necessarily the, the villainous group that I think history has made them out to be. They, they took up a lot of causes that were, were kind of noble in a lot of ways. Okay, uh, one, the next slide. Uh, this is a temperance card. I know it's hard to see, uh, at least on my screen, I don't know about everyone else. Basically, these were handed out at churches and you would sign these cards pledging to abstain from alcohol. And uh, you'd, you'd sign them in churches. So this is an actual temperance, uh, uh, abstain from alcohol card for my collection. Uh, one more slide. Okay, and this is uh, please vote dry for me. So these were pinbacks from that era where people were out there, you know, trying to get people to, to vote dry. Uh, and one more slide. Okay, here we go. So this is Hiram Gill. So Hiram Gill, this is the guy that was leading the, uh, the, the open town side of things and was elected mayor. And he signed off on the 500 room brothel. Uh, as I mentioned, Mark Matthews hired some detectives to kind of keep tabs on him. A few months after the brothel opened, um, of course, the detectives found out about it pretty quickly. It's kind of hard to miss a 500 room brothel operating in the city. Um, and they followed the paper trail and it led right back to Hiram Gill. And so they brought their findings back to Mark Matthews who immediately released it to all this, the local papers. And it was a full blown scandal. And um, so as I mentioned, the women were once again granted the right to vote in 19, the 1910 elections, Washington women. And um, so they took this as their cause. As soon as news broke that he had allowed a 500 room broth of open, um, and not only that, but, but he, he never kept his campaign promise. He never, you know, confined everything to one part of town. Things just proliferated probably even more than they originally had been. So people were fed up with them. So a year into his tenure as mayor, uh, they got enough signatures and they held a recall election. It was the first of its kind in the, in the country. And so a recall election was held and voters voted overwhelmingly to, to boot him out of office, to recall him from office. So a year later, uh, Hiram Gill was sent packing. And this Brad, was a huge, yes, uh-huh. What year was that, that he was mayor? Uh, so he was elected mayor in 1910 and he was okay, recalled in 1911. Thank you. Yeah, yep, you're very welcome. Um, so yeah, he was booted from office. Um, now, this really kind of gave a lot of energy to the local temperance groups. So people like Mark Matthews uh, saw this as a huge victory. He, he always despised Hiram Gill and he, he was the one that kind of ultimately his detectives, you know, uncovered the scandal that led to his downfall. And this is when he aligned with the local temperance groups like the Women's Christian Temperance Union and Anti-Saloon League. And they kind of banded together and this, they really took off. They were really energized by all this. They started passing legislation known as um, uh, local town legislation. So what that was is individual towns throughout Washington could vote um, on if they wanted to go dry or not. So a lot of towns throughout Washington voted to go dry, but they wanted to kind of take things even further. So uh, in Leading up to 1914, the 1914 elections, they started gathering a bunch of signatures for a state initiative to for wash the entire state of Washington to go dry. Um, and they got they gathered enough signatures to, to put it on the ballot. And it was uh, Washington State Initiative number three, the third state initiative. And if if it passed, it would ban the sale and manufacture of alcohol. And ultimately, so that means would put saloons out of business. And it was a very energetic topic. Um, it spread throughout Washington. It was very um, talked about and controversial, but it went on the ballot uh, in November of 1914 and Washington voters approved 
the initiative. So Washington voted to go dry in 1914. Um, it didn't go into effect until January 1st, 1916, but it laid the groundwork for that. Um, so that was a very, very um, memorable initiative when that happened. And that, a lot of other states throughout the country were doing similar things, and that eventually laid the groundwork for national prohibition in 1920. Now, um, an interesting thing that happened uh, in 1940, another uh, improbable outcome is Hiram Gill, our good friend here, Hiram Gill, um, since he got recalled from office, he had time to think about the errors of his ways. And so he presented himself as reformed change man. He came out and said, you know, I realize errors in my ways and I'm now a closed town proponent. And he ran for mayor again in the 1914 election and, you know, said, I, I'm, if I'm elected mayor, if you give me one more chance, I'll solve the very problems that I helped create. We'll put an end to this, this scourge of saloons and vice. And apparently he was convincing enough because he was elected mayor once again, believe it or not, in 1914. Um, so that's another improbable outcome. And if I'm sure the main question on everyone's minds is, well, did he keep his campaign pledges the second time and actually do what he said he was going to do? And for that, you're just going to have to read my book and find out. And with that, I open the, the, the floor to questions. And Dora Faye is going to... Uh, uh, field questions from you guys and I'm going to be here answering as many of them as you have. I was, thank you. I was going to ask these questions that I've already asked you did come from the audience um, just a few minutes ago. What is the origin of the word temperance? I don't know. That's a good question. I would have to look that up. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I think temperance, if I'm not mistaken, and someone in the audience could probably uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it just means abstaining from. I think that's one of the definitions of it. So I think the temperance movement just in, in broad terms meant, you know, abstaining from alcohol. Okay. Uh, one of the audience members asked, was the Bayview Brewery on the same site as the present day Rainier building? And who lived in the man mansion behind it in the picture that was shown? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, that's a fun photograph to study. There's also um, a streetcar track you can see going through the front of it, too. Um, that was part of the interurban uh, railway. Um, yes, to answer your question, yes. So that's the site of the present day Rainier Brewery. I guess the brewery itself, of course, isn't there anymore. It's now storage, uh, a storage unit. They, of course, they still have the, the big Rainier R on the side. Um, but yeah, that was the location of it. Incidentally, a little historical aside for you. So the 500 room brothel, um, at the time it, so after they shut it down as a brothel, it became an apartment building. And in the 1950s, it was still an apartment building. It was very, uh, it was an apartment building for working class workers. A lot of them from Boeing, nearby Boeing Field. Uh, in 19, I believe it was in 1952, uh, one of the big jumbo Boeing planes was taken off from Boeing Field and developed engine trouble and um, lost control. And it went flying, it clipped the very top of the Rainier Brewery. The brothel, or the site of the former brothel, it was known as the Lester Apartments at that time, was right across the street from where the brewery was. Um, and the plane smashed into the, the Lester Apartments, the old, the old brothel, and um, completely destroyed it. There was casualties. And until the ambulances had a, a chance to get down there, the brewery workers at Rainier kind of were the first seen uh, rescue workers. So they were loading a lot of the wounded and stuff from this terrible uh, plane crash onto the Rainier Brewery trucks and bringing them to Harborview Hospital. So another little historical aside about Rainier Brewery. That's interesting. I'd never heard that before. I don't know if the others have. Is there a way that Michael could put that picture up again? Because that was fairly early in your presentation. Of yeah, the uh, um, Bayview Brewery. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's one of the first ones. Uh, 
Uh, there we go. There we go. Oh. Yeah, that's only the second one or whatever. Yeah. If you go up one, I think that, that there we go. Yeah, that one. Oh, very yeah. good. Yeah. Okay, from the um, stories of the brothel, <laughs> Brad, to the church. Where was yeah. Matthew's um, Presbyterian Church downtown? And is there any uh, lineage between Matthew's and the very large University Presbyterian Church in the U District? Yeah, there is. Um, I forget the exact address. I believe it was on what is now like Fourth Union and maybe um, Union or University, somewhere in that area. I think it was the site of the original church. Um, Mark Matthews, yeah, eventually his church spread and the University Presbyterian Church was an offshoot of his original church. Uh, Matthews also um, helped found Harborview Hospital. Uh, so he did a lot of kind of humanitarian work after Prohibition. There's a statue of him in Denny Park. Um, there's a large bust style statue of Mark Matthews because of his contribution. So oh, he, he left his mark on Seattle in a pretty major way. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. One of the audience members by the name of Brad is asking you, Brad, how did the churches <laughs> line up on the temperance issue? Liberal versus conservative or what? Um, a lot of the churches at the time were, were definitely strictly against um, the vice, the, the saloons and stuff. So they were definitely on the side of the temperance movement. Um, and again, it's, it, history is kind of a weird thing. So I, like the definition of what's conservative and progressive had kind of different meanings back then. But again, the, the, the temperance movement was seen as a progressive cause. And I think a lot of churches viewed themselves as progressive. It's, it's changed somewhat. And now, you know, a lot of the more evangelical churches uh, are more on the conservative side of things. But at the time, I think a lot of churches were trying to do more humanitarian things and trying to, like, help people. And they were, had more progressive ideals. So, again, it's kind of counterintuitive to think about such a thing as, you know, prohibition and the temperance movement as being progressive. But that's just kind of how it was viewed at the time. Okay, take it from a historian. Yeah. Um, another anonymous attendee is asking, were drugs, and I'd like to know about hard liquor, were, were those um, problems during the same time, opium even? Um, yeah, there, there definitely was opium. There were um, quite a few opium dens in what is now Chinatown. But there was a lot of a lot of the box houses. There were um, stories about you know you could go to these box houses, and again, pretty much any type of vice you wanted was available, including narcotics. So yeah, opium was was available. I don't think it was a, super popular at the time. I think drinking was more popular. Um, once the gold rush hit and kind of the civility of the early saloons kind of went by the wayside, I think there was a lot more hard alcohol wasn't just beer, but it was a lot of whiskey and stuff like that. So that was there too. Okay. Marcy wants to thank you for this interesting history. She's yeah. asking, do you know about the tunnel to the house on 63rd Avenue and Alki where Gypsy Rose Lee lived? This was told to John Lee Joseph in an oral history done with Bob Halbert, but the tunnel was used to deliver hooch. <laughs> um, I don't know about that particular tunnel, but tunnels were a very popular thing at the time. Um, uh, my, as far as my personal experience with them goes, um, when I was writing my book, the Seattle Prohibition book, and I was doing the research phase of it, um, in the International District, they were renovating the, the Louisa Hotel. Uh, when, they, when that happened, they uncovered this, this kind of walled off section of the hotel that had been vacant for a long time. And they found a lot of these really uh, pretty amazing, beautiful murals from the 1920s. And they didn't know what they were at the time, but they were murals of people from that time period. So a lot of women in kind of flapper looking clothes and hairstyles, guys in top hats, um, looked like they were out having a night at town. And they, then they found, uh, once they followed the staircase down, they found like a club area down below, but they, they didn't know much of the story behind it. They could just tell it was from the 1920s and, you know, maybe it was a speakeasy. They weren't really sure. Um, 
and I saw a little blurb about it. At the time, I was doing research at the National Archives, and I just happened, right after I read this blurb, uh, I just happened to pick up this box of documents at the National Archives, and I started going through it, and I found all these documents and newspaper clippings talking about this, the, the most popular speakeasy at the time. It had a lot of different names. Uh, one of its names was known as the Bucket of Blood, and it was located down there in the International District. Um, and it had been raided in 1931 by federal prohibition agents. And <clears throat> I had heard of it before. Um, so it really caught my curiosity. I was like, wow, you know, I finally found some documents about this place. And I found the address for it. And lo and behold, it was this place that they had just been covered at the Luisa Hotel. So I was able to share that with the owner, who was very excited to get the news. And from that, she invited me down to, to see this place that had just been uncovered. Um, so I joined a small team of other, you know, historians and researchers, and uh, we were accompanied by a bunch of construction workers, and they found a tunnel in this place, and uh, it was an escape tunnel. So, and this was a very popular thing at the time during Prohibition, is a lot of these speakeasies would have escape tunnels. So if the place was raided, people had a place to escape out into the alley behind and get away from the police. So to answer your question, I don't know about that particular escape tunnel, but they were very common at the time. Um, and if they did find a tunnel, that's probably what it was for. Yep. Thank you. Debbie has yeah. two questions. She wants to know when they can, we, when get we pre-purchase your new book and are you thinking about doing any writing about underground Seattle? Uh, well, one of the, uh, so the, to answer your first question, so my book uh, about Al Hubbard um, is going to be due in, in August. Um, I'm really excited for that book. He's one of the more fascinating figures to ever emerge from Seattle history, but a lot of people don't know about him. So I'm really hoping my book about him, my biography about him, will change that. Um, he was uh, an early mysterious, he, he was an early inventor in Seattle. He had this really mysterious invent that he came out with that people still don't really fully understand how it operated yet uh, but it supposedly drew energy from the air and powered boats and cars and things like that he then became part of Roy Olmsted's uh, bootlegging operation uh, during World War II he was involved in these these top secret um, uh, missions here in Washington State going up to Vancouver BC um, smuggling planes back and forth he was supposedly part of the Manhattan Project. And then in the 50s, he became uh, the Johnny Appleseed of LSD, introducing uh, LSD that had just kind of been discovered to a lot of really influential people. So really fascinating figure. That's going to be due in March. Uh, as far as pre-orders go, um, usually about a month or so before, you know, you'll be able to, to purchase and pre-order the book on Amazon, different places like that. Of course, I also encourage people to visit their local booksellers. Um, I'm a big, huge supporter of local bookstores and keeping them in business. And you can definitely pre-order this book from uh, pretty much any local independent bookstore will, will likely be able to get you a copy. So, um, but if you can't, you can, you can get it online too. And I would start looking for it maybe in June or July, I think is when it'll start be available for pre-sale. Uh, and then as far as the underground goes, uh, one of my, I, I'd like to write an essay about, um, for historylink.org, I'm a contributing writer for History Link, and I'm hoping to write uh, an essay, kind of the biography of Bill Speedle, who, who started the Seattle Underground. So that's going to be hopefully my contribution to Seattle Underground is writing his story. He, he's a very interesting person too from Seattle's past. Very good. We got a few more questions and then we'll wrap it up. Um, okay. Two of them. What do you know about the Jolly Roger speakeasy on Lake City Way and Northeast mm -hmm. 88? And do you have any info to add about speakeasies and road houses along, oops, along Lake City Way and Aurora in the north end of town? Yeah. Um... Okay, so to answer your first part of your question, so yeah, the Jolly Roger was um, it was a roadhouse that operated on Lake City Way. Um, there's a lot of debate if it operated as a speakeasy or not. Some people say it it kind of came on the scene a little too late. Um, but 
from my research and from anecdotal evidence I heard, I, I think it definitely operated as a speakeasy. There's a lot of rumors that um, it also had a tunnel down below in its basement that supposedly led across the street to a um, uh, like a really racist name place, but you've probably heard of it, the Coon Chicken Inn. It was a very controversial place. So supposedly there was a, an escape tunnel connecting the two places. Um, it eventually burned down. I don't remember the exact year, but the the Jolly Roger eventually um, burned down. I think a gas station now inhabits the, the space it formerly occupied. As far as roadhouses go, um, I'm completely fascinated by the, the history of roadhouses. And I've partnered with um, another local historian who's written a lot about the local music scene. And we have an upcoming essay for History Link about roadhouses on both Highway 99 and Lake City Way. He is covering the Lake City Roadhouses. I'm covering the Highway 99 Roadhouses. Um, I um, live up here in Edmonds, where a lot of them were, were kind of concentrated. Uh, the house I used to live in was about two blocks away from the place that was formerly known as the Ranch Roadhouse. Uh, it was also known as the El Rancho. That was one of the more bigger ones. But um, yeah, I have a lot of pictures and things in my collection and um, we're even talking about collaborating on a book about the local roadhouses because they're they were a fascinating uh, thing. And for those who don't know what roadhouses were, um, they basically started out as um, speakeasies um, in the kind of late 1920s, and a lot of them were concentrated here in Seattle on either <clears throat> on what's now Highway 99 or Aurora or Lake City Way or you know the Bothell Highway. <clears throat> or south of the city on Highway 99. And the reason for that is because they kind of wanted to be away from off the radar from the Seattle police and local prohibition officials. Uh, after prohibition was repealed in 1933, they became known as bottle clubs. And the reason they called them that is because um, there were laws on the books that um, hard liquor, you couldn't sell anything more than 3.4% alcohol in, in bars and stuff. The only place you could buy hard liquor was in state liquor stores. But for uh, until the late 40s, uh, taverns and bars weren't allowed to sell hard liquor, nothing over 3.4%. Uh, but bottle clubs got around this by, they would encourage people to bring in their own bottles of booze. It was, you know, uh, on the DL. Uh, but if you looked at a lot of the old menus from a lot of these bottle clubs, they have these, these beverage sections where they offer this vast array of mixers, you know, ginger ale and lime juice and pitchers of ice and stuff. And that's why people would bring in their own bottles of booze. They were rated a lot. Uh, they were very sketchy because they operated outside the scope of the law. A lot of them had illegal gambling going on. Um, the ones on Highway 99 were particularly rowdy. They, uh, a lot of them had, um, inns or motels located next to it because there was a lot of prostitution involved so they would um you know they would have prostitutes in the roadhouses and then they could conveniently go to these these motels that were located next door so yeah i've been fascinated by history of roadhouses and hopefully an essay is coming out this year on history link about them and um, hopefully we get our book off the ground too thank you uh, uh here's a late question do you have any commentary on the Kenwell Committee and how it played out in Seattle? And the and a comment that that airplane crash is where the pilot checklists come from. There's still a marker on Beacon Hill to commemorate the crash. Yeah, there is a marker. Uh, I don't know about the Campbell Committee. I'm not I'm not familiar with that. that was that must have been uh, something happening more on the federal, on like on a higher federal level? But I'm not sure how that influenced Seattle Prohibition. So. I'm sorry, I don't have a, an answer for that particular question. Okay, two more, uh, just maybe one question. Where was, is it Norman Gill or Hiram Gill? Where were they from? Hiram Gill was from, uh, if I remember right, I think he was from Chicago, somewhere in the Midwest. And uh, yeah, and again, he, he was an attorney and he came out here during the gold rush days. But I think maybe it was St. Louis, somewhere in the Midwest. I don't remember the exact city, but he was, he was a Midwesterner. All right. 
and lots of comments that say they loved your book and this presentation. Okay. Thank you. Great fun to hear the history. Call a fascinating lecture and we confirm um, Diane's love for Seattle and it's a very colorful history. <laughs> it is very colorful history. I'm glad you enjoyed it. So thank you. Yes, it was great. And just a reminder again, I answered a question that someone had asked about um, seeing a part of the program that they missed. And I told them about, and I'll just say it out loud for everyone's sake, that our programs are all recorded and are available on the website for the mm -hmm. Historical Society. And they'll be up, what, within days or a week or so, Michael? Yeah, within a few days, hopefully. Yeah, uh, within a week at most. Great. All right. Well, I enjoyed this participation, my participation, Brad. This is fun. Yeah. So we'll uh, keep your phone number. So we'll get back in touch when your other book comes out. Sounds great. And thank you again for hosting me tonight. Yeah, thank you. And thank yeah. everybody for being here. Yeah, thanks, Brad. And again, thanks uh, to our audience for your support this evening. We really appreciate it. Brad, that was a magnificent presentation and, and just such Thank a you. fascinating, fascinating chapter in, in our community's history. So we really appreciate it. I also want to, again, thank everybody for joining us. Uh, I'll, I'll give another shout out to our uh, sponsors and uh, partners at Four Culture, Luna Park Cafe, the Seattle Public Library, and Duwamish Tribal Services. Again, we can't do this without your support. So if you enjoyed uh, this evening's program, I'd encourage you to uh, purchase a membership or, or make a donation to the Historical Society. You can help to uh, uh, make sure these experiences are, are available to as uh, wide a segment of our community as possible. So we really appreciate your support. And as I mentioned at the start of the evening, if you enjoyed tonight's presentation, you might also uh, enjoy our special panel conversation here for the beer, which is scheduled again for Friday, February 26th at 5.30 p.m. Be sure to register on our website to learn about the history of brewing from brewers at Elliott Bay Brewing, Future Primitive Brewing, and the Good Society. You don't want to miss out, and we're hoping that you'll join us on February 26th. With that, uh, again, thanks for joining us. I'm looking forward to seeing you later this month, and in the meantime, I hope you stay healthy and safe, and we'll see you again soon. Take care. Good night. Good night.